I have grown these daikon radishes before as a cover crop, but I had no idea you could eat them. I don't know what I was thinking, but I was in Publix the other night, the big grocery store in town, mm -hmm. and they had daikon radishes in there for sale, and they was getting an outrageous price for them. So I think what, a few dollars a bunch. So I'm thinking to myself, I'm fishing to get rich. Yeah, yeah, those things were expensive. Now they was bigger than mine. Mine's about half grown. But they was huge, and these would get huge. But man, that's a lot of radish right there. They sell them with the top. No, no, they just sell just the root and had them wrapped in cellophane, and that just purely amazed me. You could probably get even more dollar for them if you yep. sell them with the tops on them there. Yep. You tried one? No, but I'm going to. Right now? Yeah. Like a big old white carrot, don't they? Yeah. Just think. It ain't any spices in them. It ain't near as spicy as them other ones. It's got a good flavor. It's more like a turnip. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty good. But it don't have a spiciness. I've heard of folks getting high dollar for these things. And yep. uh, that'd make a mean cover crop. Anyways, let's say hello hi to everybody. Hello. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Row by Row Garden Show. I'm Travis. And I'm Greg. And we're excited you're joining us this evening. We've got a great show planned for you. We're going to talk about... There's a little spice on the back end there. Yeah, but it ain't bad. Anyway, we're going to talk about planting taters tonight. Um, have our show and tell segment. Going to answer some questions at the end of the show. And if you have any questions during the show, always put those in the comments and we will get to them on next week's show. Um, back to the, the daikons real quick. So the reason these things make such an awesome cover crop is because think of these things it's like a tine on a broad fork. So you can use something like a broad fork to aerate your soil or whatever, especially if you got hard soil. And you got these things just, if you plant them thick enough, I mean every couple inches there, aerating the soil. Another thing they do, because they- they'll, oh, they'll get twice as long as what this is. Yeah, they'll get real long here. And what they're doing is they're pulling, basically they're absorbing all these nutrients from way down deep where you would never get. And then they're concentrating them all in this unit right here. And then when you till them in, you're releasing them nutrients. So it's a way to kind of, it's like a nutrient well. A way bank. To, it's a bank. Nutrient bank, that's right. Now when you go to till these things in, they till up real good. So you don't have any problem getting rid of them. It's one of my favorite cover crops. And they crops. break down pretty quick. They break down quick. This is a, a must do for a cover crop in the wintertime. It's daikon radishes. Daikon radishes. And you, you could do these as an early spring cover crop too. Yeah. Um, but the tops are really pretty. And uh, that's good stuff right there. And my mustard cover crop, I tilled it in the other day. Got all those glucosinolates well, released? We did. You know, we was talking about how it was the best way to do all that. So I took my tiller and just tilled it in. I did it all at once and it worked really well. Broke it up, put it underneath the dirt there, and it didn't take me no time. So I think for the home gardener, tilling that mustard in is going to be the key because a lot of people don't have uh, access to a flail mower and they come behind it with a hair. Mm -hmm. If you do, that's probably ideal too. We talked, you got 20 minutes to do it to capture those gases. But tilling it in worked well for me. Did one pass? No. I made about three passes. See, there. that's where I messed up. I just did one pass and I should have did several. Mm -hmm. I stayed with it. Stayed with I it? Stayed of course, you got that uh, fancy new tiller. Mm -hmm. It does a little better job than old Troy does. Yeah, um, yeah. But I, I should have went over mine a few more times to chop it up. So I got mustard greens turned in and I'm gonna let it decompose for a few days and I'm gonna use that for my tater planting spot. Yeah, okay. So I'm getting juiced up by tater planting. Juiced up, yeah, you wanna wait a couple weeks after yeah. you till in that mustard. Yep, yep. Cause if you plant right behind it, you're gonna have some problems. It's gonna That's gas right. up and kill your seed. That's right. Um, and we're going to talk about tater planting today. Well, um, you got your shallots planted already. I did. And I went, when I was at the grocery store, there was not plumaging around in the produce section. I found me some shallots. And I'd never eat a shallots because I planted mine the other day. And I wanted, to, so I bought me three, three shallots. Uh -huh. And I come home and I cooked them last night. Uh -huh, put them, I diced them up. I put them in olive oil, put a little lemon juice in there. Excuse me. And I sauteed them. And then they do have a different flavor profile than the onion does. Mm -hmm. It's it's a sweeter, and it's it's not like a non-burning sweet like the Vidalia, but it is a sweeter flavor than an onion is. Hmm. So in stews and soups and things like that, I can see where that 
flavor profile would be uh, beneficial over an onion. Okay. So I'm gradually becoming a shallot fan. Good deal. Good deal. And I got me three rows planted, by the way. I'm going to plant me some maybe tomorrow, if not this weekend, and uh, shoot a little video on it. I think I've got a neat little trick up my sleeve of how I'm going to get these shallots from uh, my hand to the dirt. We'll see how it works on the video. Okay. Um, did you did you happen to uh i know you don't always watch all the videos i post but did I you have some did you <laughs> did you watch the one we posted yesterday i did so um did if you if you haven't seen the video we posted the video yesterday we were posing the question if you could only have five hand tools to work your vegetable garden with what would you pick and um i picked five on the video and you can go check that out on our youtube channel and uh, I just wanted to get your thoughts if you could replace one or... Yeah, uh, I would swap would you... one out. And there was a couple of people mentioned this on the group. I think the wheelbarrow, I'd have to put it in there. I liked your pick, but I'd have to replace one of them with the what wheelbarrow. What would you take out for the wheelbarrow? Uh, maybe the bat wing. I don't know. Okay. Just not have a hoe? Oh, I, 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 I don't Because you can only have five. It's, it's tough. That's tough. But I definitely would work the wheelbarrow in there somewhere. I don't know. That's gonna, I'd have to step and not think about that one. Because if you, you take out the shovel, a wheelbarrow will do you much good if you ain't got a shovel. Right. right. Got to have a digging fork and yeah. a rake. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I just I just like my wheelbarrow. I yeah, just, I like my wheelbarrow too. But I was thinking if it if, only if, five. if it was only five and hard times, I could use buckets and haul. Yeah, I could. If it was hard times, I could get by without it. But it sure would just make it easy on the old man. That's right. Mm -hmm. So check that out and... Uh, we like to hear everybody's thoughts on that. Put your top five or what five you'd pick in those comments on that video. And uh, we really look forward to hearing from you there. Um, today's show, we're talking about taters. Taters, taters, Before taters. we get into that, let's 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 show this. Dr Ooh. Drum roll. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to do a, a, you're going to have to do a can one. Do a can one? Okay. So our 2019 catalogs are here. Can everybody see that? And they should be hitting mailboxes maybe as of the airing of this video, if not the next few days. Um, if you ordered from us in the last, actually, if you've ever ordered from us, uh, you should be receiving one. If you've requested a catalog within the last year, you should be receiving one. If you don't think you fall into either of those categories, you scroll to the bottom of our homepage at hostools.com. There's a button there that says request a catalog. You can get put on the list there, and usually within a couple weeks, we'll have you one. So, this is our 2019 catalog. A lot of good stuff in here. We opened, we started off with some seeds in there. There's about four pages of seeds. Now, because this catalog can only be so big, we just kind of picked our our favorites to put in the first couple pages there. If you want to see the whole selection, go online for that. Because we got a lot more seed and we add more every day. Right. We can only put so much stuff in this catalog. We can put everything on the website. So this is kind of as a teaser. You go on the website, you'll see absolutely everything. Um, so we've got our drip irrigation. We've got new attachments in there. Um, you got your high arch in there, which is becoming ever so more popular. All kind of good stuff in there. So if you get the catalog, take a look at it not go ahead and request you one and we'll get one sent to you now on to the taters so last week we uh gave everybody the news that we was carrying taters and we got them on the site i think as of friday we got four varieties you want to recap those real quick we got Did the you bring a knife i don't have a knife on do me. i have a knife <clears throat> no go right i got a knife let's cut them open so we got four varieties. We got the Yukon Gold, which is a got a nice yellow flesh on it. Which is, which is in my opinion, the go-to tater. It makes real big taters. We've got the Adirondack Blue. Adirondack Blue, and if you got kids or grandkids in your family, you got to grow a few of these. Now, th would this be the only tater I grow? No. But I would definitely throw some in the mix because you could make you some blue mashed potatoes out of that. And that'll really be a trick for them youngsters. They'd like to see that kind of stuff. Or you can fry them, whatever. But it's really entertaining to cook some of these up. And they're good. 
So the Adirondack Blue, then we got the Red Norlin, which is an improved variety of red tater, or with a white skin on there. That's your new potato. That's your new potato. Everybody wants to grow the white potato, so there you see your white potato, if you got to have a white tater. And then the last one here is called the German Butterball. And this is... This is the one got the butter building in right there. Okay. Now this is a smaller potato. It's good for roasting and things like that. It's got a probably a little bit higher flavor profile. I use that a lot on the mouth. Yeah. Flavor profile. Mm -hmm. But it's a good tater right there. Okay, so we've got those four. We've got two more coming that are on back order. But we've got those four now. And um, a note about the potatoes. In case you don't know, you can't ship taters if it's freezing outside. If they freeze, they will ruin. So, as it says on the website, we will ship them as soon as we can. And by that, we mean we'll look at the weather that morning. If we can, if we can get them to you in time, we will. So, and the reason why we decided to procure potatoes is because 90% of the countries that sell seed potatoes are up north. And us people down in the south, when we get ready to order seed potatoes, they cannot ship them to us. So we're able to bring them in here and ship them out to these people in the southern zones, like zone 7, zone 8, and zone 9, zone 10. We can ship them out to you when they can't, and you can get them and get them in the dirt. And you go to, to any other seed company online, and they'll tell you, well, we're not going to ship, start shipping taters to April 19th or something like that. And, by that time, we, we should got have... Them up, we got them up and laid them by one time. That's right. So um, we wanted to give the opportunity uh, for the southern growers to have potatoes earlier and then also as, as temperatures warm for the nor northern growers as well. I will say that we do have a, I won't say a limited supply, but when we're out, we're out. So uh, if, you, if you want them and are ready to plant them. You can go ahead and order them and then we'll ship them when we can, which would be before your planting date, I can promise you that. I don't even care if you're in zone 10. If you need some potatoes, you go ahead and order them and we'll get them out to you. And we do have a trick or two up our sleeve. If we think it's gonna to get too cold, we might work something out. The deal you need to remember, if you order them from us, you're gonna get them in time. That's right. That's right, and we're going to talk about potato planting dates too. I'll show everybody this. So, my main man here, Greg, has been back there packing taters. It's not something I want to do full time, by the way. And this is we have each all, each of those four varieties. We have them in ten pound, twenty five pound, and fifty pound bags. This is a ten pound bag, just to give you an idea of what it looks like. That's plenty enough for a forty foot row of taters, if not a little more. You know, 25 pound bags will be two and a half times size that, and a 50 pound bag is gonna look like a feed sack. Or you can go in with your neighbor and order you a bigger sack and split them with you, it won't cost you quite as much. You get a little better deal. So if you got a neighbor or two that does like to plant potatoes, y'all go in together and figure out what you need and put that order in. Split them up, that's a good idea there. Okay, so let's get into to more specifics about growing potatoes and planting potatoes. Of these four varieties here, when you do some research online, every potato variety has kind of a different date of maturity. You'll see some that they call an early variety. Some you'll see early to mid, mid to late, late, so forth. So I kind of want to go over that with the varieties we have here. So the, typically your red taters with the white center, like this uh, red Norlin here, are your early potatoes. They're the mm -hmm. ones that are gonna come in quicker than, than any of your others, mm -hmm. about 85 days. Mm -hmm. And then as you move on down the line, what they call kind of early to mid would be this one here, the Adirondack Blue, and that's gonna be 90 day tater. Mm -hmm. Yukon Gold is kind of what they call a mid, or mid to late, mm -hmm. and that's gonna be 100 days. And this here German tater, German Butterball, we talked about 110 days on it. So with that being said, taters don't like real hot temperatures, okay? With these, because they don't take as long to grow, you got a little more leeway with your planting time. With something that leaves late varieties like the German Butterballs, you wanna get them in as soon as you can. When you're planting these, also make sure you understand when you're planting them, you plant these at the same time, you're gonna dig these about a month later than you're gonna dig these, which works out really good for a lot of people. A lot of times I plant so many taters, I can't get out there and dig them all in one day. So I'll 
dig the row of these one week and then a couple of weeks down the road dig so a row what of i these. did last year was i planted one row of each variety that's what i like to do and i had them come in at different times and then you dig one a week that way you just it just don't burn you out getting out there all day. And you got fresh taters along and along. That's right. So something to consider there that the timeline of the maturity on the taters and how you might want to, to uh, strategize your planting. Now let's talk about planting or getting ready to plant potatoes. Mm -hmm. Now this is something I like to do in the shop. I like to get me a five gallon bucket and I like to sit on it and I get my knife out and I got me a five gallon bucket in front of me and I got my old dog laying there beside of me and I'm having a peaceful moment, me and my dog and I'm cutting up taters. Mm -hmm. That's the way I like to do it. Yeah, that's a good way to do it. Now let's talk about, I've seen, I will see people on videos from time to time planting whole taters. So let's talk about the advantages and disadvantages of cutting them. If you do plant, Let's get this Yukon Gold, for instance. See if I can put it back together. There we go. If you plant this whole tater right here, it's gonna grow a tater plant just as if you cut it. But what's gonna happen is you're gonna get a bunch of little taters. You're gonna get more potatoes because you got more buds planted, but it's gonna be overcrowded there and they're all gonna, gonna kind of be small. So if you like lots of small taters, you can plant the whole one. We've always, because we like to stretch our seed taters out further, we cut them up. And we usually, what's the rule? We leave two, two, to, th to, three. two to three eyes per piece. You could probably cut this piece one more time and this one one more time. And if you want the big taters, you need to cut them up like that. And that's going to give them plenty of room because uh, you're only dealing with two to three sprouts per piece there. Now, your grandmother's 92 years old. Mm-hmm. Great grandmother. Great grandmother, excuse me, your great grandmother's 92 years old and she come up through the depression. Now she'd have pure fit if you didn't cut those eyes out and save the middle to cook. That's what they used to do is they would cut the eyes out and they would cook those, they'd still have taters to cook and they was real peculiar about not wasting any. And to this day, she has sort of has a fit when you go to cook, cutting up seed taters about not saving that inside there because it was just that hard of a times back in the day. But that used to be real peculiar about cutting them eyes out. Now, we don't do that anymore because times ain't like what they used to be. But I always thought that was interesting that times was that hard that you had to get a meal out of your seed potatoes. Hmm. Well, there would be a little bit of a law of diminishing returns there because you got to give it enough this is kind of what it's living off of while it's forming a plant. So. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it was just that hard now. Yeah. Them times was hard. Hard times. Um, when we cut these potatoes, you want to make, you got to plan ahead several days um, before you plant them. When you cut them, you got to give them time to heal over or what they call superize. Superize. Now in the past, we have used some stuff called fur bark dust. We don't have any of that this year. Some people have used sulfur. Sulfur. And what that does is it you coat it with that and it allows you to go boom, boom, cut the plant. And it, what it actually does is it lowers the pH of that site and kind of heals it over. The sulfur and the fur bark, both of them have properties in them to lower the pH and it causes them to heal over real quick. So if you got just some sulfur fur bark, you can cut and plant right then. Now that being said, I've been planting taters for a long time and I've always just cut them up with the exception of a time too when we did have the fur bark. I've tried these things and I ain't have no problems but I don't have any problems just cutting them up and letting them heal and plant them. But mm -hmm. I got good, high, sandy dirt, and I always let them heal for about a few days, three or four days a week, and plant them. And I only had trouble one year. Mm -hmm. Of all the years I can think, I had a bad, bad, wet year one year, and they rotted in the dirt on me. Right. So if you wait, if you cut them, let them sit in that bucket for about three to four days, they'll heal over nicely, and uh, you can go to plant them then. That's always good practice. Uh, the keeps the this thing freshly cut is kind of susceptible to some fungal disease. So letting that heal over and superize is going to help. Yeah, that. keep it in your barn or somewhere where it can't get rain in there. You don't want to get no moisture. Keep it under a shelter in your shop, your barn, your carport, or whatever. Keep them dry and they'll heal right over. All right, let's talk about planting potatoes, when to plant, and then kind of how we do it. So I was doing some research just because. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me well that's carrying all these seeds or stuff you kind of have to put a date to maturity on a seed or a seed potato but it's 
that number is just so arbitrary because it can depend on a bunch of different things. And planting dates are kind of the same way sometimes. But I was doing some research and the almanac, the farmer's almanac actually says to plant potatoes zero to two weeks after the last frost, which I thought was strange. Cause, that is strange. Uh, we always plant much sooner than that. They said you got to wait till the soil temperature is 45 to 55 degrees. Hmm. Um, but... Other sites online, you know, kind of browsing everybody's opinion out there, says to plant two to three weeks before the last frost. And that's more in line with what we've always done. Yeah, the, all the old timers around here tell you you got to plant them on February the 14th, which is Valentine's Day. I normally wait a couple weeks after that, and I plant anywhere from the third to the fourth week in February, somewhere there. And we're in zone eight. So that's kind of my rule of thumb, and I hear people that's had success doing it any time. Now, don't get much into March. If you're in Zone 8, don't get much into March planting your potatoes. They won't have enough time. Yeah. Now, let's talk about Zone 9. What about Zone 9? That's the one below us. That is Central Florida, South Texas, a little bit of Arizona, and I don't even want to talk about California, but a little bit of California's got Zone 9 in it. Yeah. If you in Zone 9, you need to be getting tater planting on your mind seriously because it's yeah. getting about time. <clears throat> yeah, so Zone 9 has a, a average last frost date between February 16 and 28. So y'all can be planting right now up to the end of February, right. um, getting taters in the ground. Our last frost date is... Average last frost date. Average last frost date is uh, middle of March. So uh, that puts February right in our wheelhouse. Um, let's go over the others here. So if you're uh, in Zone 7, average frost date is in uh, April. First, early April. First so you 15 want, days of April. So if you're in zone seven, you want to be planting taters probably middle of March. Yep. If you're in zone six, you probably want to be planting taters first to April. End of March, first of April, yep. Right. And if you're in zone five, uh, your average first frost, last frost date is in early May, you want to be planting mid April. So um, hope that helps out for you. And we probably can uh, come up with a graphic and and put something like that on the website yeah. to help people yeah. out too. Yeah. When we're planting taters, we've got a little system with our wheel hoe that makes planting taters easy, quick job. Now you normally put drip on yours, don't no, you? No, I, I did one time and I, I hadn't done yeah, it Yeah, I don't since. put drip on my potatoes either. We get plenty of rainfall. They like well-drained dirt. Yeah, and we, we normally get plenty of rainfall that time of the year and I don't have any problems. I may have to water once or twice, but very seldom do I have to irrigate my potatoes, so I don't. I don't think the investment for the drip tape is warranted for me. Right now, back in the old days, for we we was making wheel hoes. The way we planted taters, we get you a hoe and you go out there and you scratch you out a furrow and uh, put your taters in it, and then take your rake and cover it up. But the way we do it nowadays is with the wheel hoe. and you really need the double wheel hoe or the high arch to make this most effective. So we got our plow blades here. You got your right and your left. And you set them up just like that. And that's what we call a middle buster here in the south. Or some people look must make may call it a furrier. Right, so we put them in what we call the furrowing position there, the middle buster position. And that's gonna make your furrow for your potatoes. That's gonna make a furrow about four to five inches deep, depending on how soft your soil is, which is perfect for mm -hmm. setting a tater down. Now, there right. you got your potatoes in your bucket that's already healed over, and you always want to plant that heel side down and plant them up. For you people up north that may not understand that, that means just like that right there. Eyes pointing towards the Eyes sun. Eyes pointing up. So they can grow up. Yep, you do them like that right there, and you're going to have upside down taters. They ain't going to work for you. So... <laughs> Uh, and and how far apart would you recommend setting? Now, I normally go about eight inches on mine, mm -hmm. somewhere in there. That's what I would say. Uh, for some of the smaller uh, varieties of taters, if you was planting some tiny fingerlings or something, you could probably stack them in there thicker than that. Yeah. But for these ones that get a little larger, eight inches I think is mm -hmm. good. And then once we lay them down in the furrow, we got to cover them up. Yeah. So then... Our plows were like this, and then all we do is switch them around like this, and with that double and high arch, we can straddle them and cover them right up. And we've got Ooh. kudos of videos out there showing how to do this, but you're talking about quick. Makes easy work out of it. Yeah, the, the thing that takes the longest time is actually putting the potatoes down 
But you can zip up, close up them rows in no yeah, time. Yeah, get your wife and your children, grandchildren, or help you plant them taters. And you can stand up there and that like you peeling with the plow, getting it set up, and, and you, they'll be through. And you can go out there and just wheel it in and cover it up. Yeah, and make you look like the smart one. The hero. Hero, that's yeah. right. So we, we close them up, and then um, I don't water mine. I, I've heard different theories on this. Should you water them before they come up out of the ground or not? My thoughts are that they're using all the nutrients from this tater meat. Uh, until they get up and form roots. So I try not to put any water on mine until they emerge. Yeah, that can be one of your biggest uh, issues with them rotting in the dirt. If you do get a, uh, a flutter and uh, it stay real wet, so I don't either. I like to get them up before I start putting water to them and fertilizer. I particularly, for one, don't like to put fertilizer in my row and plant potatoes on there. I've, excuse me, I've seen people do that in the past. I like to get them up and get it started before I start hitting mm -hmm. the fertilizer. Now, I can put some compost in there. I've done that before, and that works out fine. But I don't like to use commercial fertilizers, put it in the fur, and then plant potatoes on top of it. Mm -hmm. So once we see them leaves emerge from the ground, it's fair to assume there's roots down there. Then you can start giving them some water if you'd like. Let's talk about fertilizing potatoes. So last year, I tried this as an experiment, and it worked pretty dang good for me. Once my taters came up, before I healed them the first time, I had me some good chicken manure compost and I went and I just put it between my rows. Okay, I didn't put it on top close to the plants, just put it between the rows. So then when I threw the dirt on top of them or healed them, it was nice and mixed in. It was right there and man, they took off. Yep. Now that was some fresh litter you had that was fairly hot. It was fairly hot, and that's why I didn't put it down mm -hmm. when I planted. Right. Now if you got compost that's worked off, that's fine to put it in that fur and plant in there, but I would not put fresh manure in there. So, um, but but that worked good, side dressing that way. You could also side dress with some Chilean nitrate probably. Mm -hmm. uh, you could soil drench with maybe some 20, 20, 20. Sure. What's your preferred uh, way to fertilize potatoes? I like tatas? to heat it with 10, 10, 10 one time. Then I like to heat it with some uh, Chilean nitrate. Just on the and side? I will, and I, yeah, and on the side, and I will heat it. I will side dress with some 20, 20, 20, but I normally do that uh, on like a weekly to bi-weekly basis. If I get in a little bit of a tide, I put me some 10, 10, 10 out there on it. Yeah, taters like to be, I won't say they're as bad as onions and corn, but they like to be fed. They like to be fed and they like to be covered up. They like to be covered up. That's that's one thing. You can heal them up as much as you want. And so I like to do it usually about once every two weeks. The first time you heal them, you can do that with the wheel hoe. Yep. And then you're going to have to get out there with a hoe and a rake mm -hmm. and uh, short enough throw some you dirt You start getting them. some weeds in there, just cover them up with dirt. And we'll, we'll heal them up as tall sometimes, you know, one to two foot tall. Mm -hmm. Some folks got those fancy... Um, hipper healing discs on the tractors they yeah. can really yeah really do it up so did you want to talk about the uh oh now the, there's a little bit of problems with blight on potatoes so if you have if you have a problem with blight and blight can work in there pretty quick and cause some problems with your foliage you see it die by uh, die down you need to get you some liquid copper you can hit them potatoes with it and that'll help you with your blight problems so if you got a history of blight or it's a place that you have gardened for a number of years and you could very well be susceptible to blight, you want to get some of this liquid copper and have on hand seven to 14 days intervals in there. Hit it with this right here and that'll help with your blight. Blight and uh, potato uh, bugs is basically the only two pests that you have. Mm. Uh, it's not a terrible idea to just be preventative no, with that. you need to have it on hand, yeah. Um, and yeah, like he said, if this area you've been gardening for a while, you subject to have a problem. And I like to, I like to be ahead of the curve. Therefore, they get eat up too bad. All right. So if you have any more questions of anything we didn't cover as far as planting taters, put those in the comments, and we'll be glad to answer them next week. And now we want to get to the questions for this week. And yep. if we answer your question on the show, send us an email to cussserve at hostools.com. We'll send you a nice little prize for participating. Now, how do you pronounce that boy's name right there? I think that's M. Fimel. Oh, M. Fimel. He asked the question, guys, I often have problems with my peppers are all crowded in and wedged in the branches and end up breaking up my plants, end up trying to end up breaking up my plant trying to cut peppers out to harvest. Do you prune peppers or anything to prevent that? 
I don't, I, I understand what he's saying, especially when you're using the Florida weave trellising technique. As you're adding a new line of string there, it tends to bunch up that plant and you'll get peppers in there and they're hard to get out. A couple solutions there. When you're, when you're running your string to trellis them, try to get that string on the main stem of the plant so it's not smooshing all the leaves together. Uh, if you have a hard time doing that, another solution is to go with the cages as opposed to maybe the Florida weed. Those cages are going to let it sprawl out more, give you a little more airflow. And that helps you with disease problems too. It does. So um, be more particular with your trellising or, or go to something like cages. I don't prune them. I'll prune the bottom few when I do my first line of trellis so I make sure I get it on the main stem. But I usually don't prune peppers. Um, the cages work really well too. I've had good success with those. And we sell the, I, w I wouldn't get the tall cages for peppers, but the, small the, ones are the well. smaller 40 inches or yeah. so work great for peppers. Yeah. And then our second question is from Xavier3520. And he, he was digging back in the YouTube archives way on back there. And uh, he said he saw an old video where we talked about we were saving money on onions by growing our own uh, from seed and uh, wondering if we was going to offer any onion seed. Well, you know, that's a great point that he brings up there. We have grown our plants in the greenhouse before. That's before we started working with Dixondale. Mm -hmm. uh, buying, uh, buying your plants already and just having them come in and plant them is the easy way to do it. Now, I'm not saying you can't plant them in your greenhouse, and that may be something we look at from time to time is offering some onion seed. Maybe an opportunity. I don't know that we're going to offer it this year, but we may offer them before. But it's just easy for us to work with somebody like Dixon Dale, order them plants in, they come in, and we plant them. We always have good luck with them. That's right. And then probably back when we made that video, before we had a, the relationship we have with the onion folks now, and uh, Brian does us a solid, and he told me that our onion plants this year, he went out there and pulled them by hand. And uh, <laughs> Personally. Personally. <laughs> he wanted to make sure... Uh, I know I always kind of stay on him by getting my onions early, and uh, he made sure we get them early, and we really like the folks over there. I don't know how many acres they plant, but I know they got 2,200 acres there where they grow onion plants on. And what type of uh, rotation did he Six take? Six year. Six year rotation before they plant onions in the same spot again for disease and stuff. They got this rig on a tractor that digs up the onion plants faster than they can tie them up. It's amazing. They got that thing from overseas, somewhere Belgium or somewhere over there. It's a uh, it's pretty neat deal. But um, yeah, uh, we just like them folks so well and they do such a good job with onion plants. We'll, we let them have the onion plant thing. We might carry some onion seeds if somebody wants to start doing that. All right, and that's gonna do it for today's show. And um, hope you enjoyed it and we will see you guys next week. Take care. Mm -hmm.